It's my big pleasure to introduce Richard, most of you know him, uh, who will be talking about Ellsberg's paradox and the value of chances. Please, Richard. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here in such beautiful surroundings. So I think this is, in terms of the quality of the environment, this has been one of my top workshops. I guess. So I, I will try and follow uh, Fabio's recipe and do some mixing and perhaps do a lot of shaking uh, in the hope that agitation will improve reaction speed. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, the way I like to, I like it, my talks to be interactive. I mean, so please just ask questions at any point during this thing. There's no point in me just blathering on, you know, with my own thing unless people are following me. Uh, and in any case, I mean, I, my talks are always a kind of living embodiment of diminishing returns, you know. So uh, uh, usually the best stuff is in the first five minutes. So that's when you should really, really engage and then it sort of declines as I think I better add something else to keep people interested. Okay, so this is a topic that will no doubt be familiar to a lot of you, and I'm sure, actually, I know there are a couple of people in the room who know a lot more about this topic than I do, but um, I want to uh, try and bring something that I hope is a little bit new to thinking about decision-making and uh, the sort of severe uncertainty that's characterized by the Ellsberg setup. And uh, th this has been an area of quite a lot of... Um, debate in the last 20 years after being neglected for a fairly long time. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of interesting stuff has come out. So I'll try and engage with that interesting stuff later on if you, if you, if you give me time otherwise. If we don't, that's not the matter. Um, let me just say sort of as a kind of background, I'm broadly very sympathetic to the kinds of attempts to reform savage-style Bayesianism by admitting uh, more permissive kind of belief attitudes. I mean, in particular, I, I, I'm... I think I'm persuaded by the sort of multiple probability model of agent belief. Um, in contrast, I mean, so I say that as a kind of beginning because what you will see seems to be an attempt to fight against that. But actually, it, it, generally, I like that idea. I just think uh, it's very important to distinguish between um, the way in which agents form and change their attitudes over time and what they do when they actually have to make up their mind. And it seems to me there's something quite fundamentally different about learning agency and deciding agency. So I, what, I, what I tried, so I, what I, the sort of background to this is I think, while you're trying to learn, you should keep, be as open-minded as possible. Don't close down any possibilities that might turn out to be true. So sort of keep a broad mind. But when you make up your mind, narrow it <laughs> for the purposes of the decision. Now, in narrowing your, your mind, you'll sort of see how that works in this talk. In a, in a way, it doesn't mean irrevocable commitment. I mean, it's not like going to probability one on some contingency from which you can never kind of escape by ordinary conditionalization. It's settling on certain values, weights, for the purposes of making up your mind this time. And then life moves on and you go back to learning and so on. So that's the sort of general philosophical picture in the background. The very specific object of my talk is, is this um, so-called Ellsberg paradox, or rather there, there were two paradoxes that Ellsberg presented in his original paper, um, both of which, I mean, they, just, they demonstrate the same thing, essentially. So the version of the Ellsberg paradox that I have here is what I think is the second one that occurs in his paper, um, and involves choices between pairs of lotteries um, in which prizes uh, in this lottery depend on draws of balls from urns. So for those of you, I mean, it's probably familiar to just about everybody, but for those of who have not seen it before, the idea is this. You have an urn which contains 90 balls. 30 of them are red. You know that. And the rest are either black or yellow, but you know absolutely nothing about the, you know, the proportion that are black, the proportion that are yellow. Um, and then uh, you're asked to choose in sequence between L1 and L2, and then subsequently between L1, L3 and L4. And as you can, let me see if I can find this thing. So the, 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 the sort of salient contrast, if you like, between L1 and L2 
is that L1 gives you the, the prize. In this case, the prize is just $100 throughout, so it's a very simple setup. Gives you the prize whenever a red ball is drawn, so sort of roughly 30 out of 100 times you're going to get, you're going to get the prize. Um, whereas L2 gives you the prize when a black ball is drawn, and that gives you the prize roughly, who knows. Right. Um, then in between L3 and L4, now look what's happening. L3 gives you the prize if you draw red, if the ball that's drawn is either red or yellow. Yellow you can't see, of course, but you can, well, you can't see the word, but you can see the color. Uh, and L4 gives you the prize if it's either black or yellow that's drawn. Okay. And uh, uh, Ellsberg postulated, since been confirmed by, uh, you know, great number of experimental studies, slightly varying results and slightly varying conditions and so on, that there is a pattern of preferences that uh, one often finds. I mean, sometimes it's the majority preference, but anyway, it's a sort of robust set of preference patterns, which now, from hereafter, I'm going to call the Ellsberg preferences. And these Ellsberg preferences whoops, are the case in which you prefer L1 to L2 and you prefer L4 to L3. So at Ellsberg uh, hypothesized that people would express this preference. He himself said that he had this, this preference pattern and pointed out that it's in violation of what was then the standard theory, still is the standard theory, namely Savage's theory of subjective expected utility maximization. All right, why, is, why does it violate Savage's expected utility theory? Well, uh, uh, I think probably the, the most obvious way in which it violates it is that it violates the separability or sure thing principle, which uh, uh, is, the, if you like, the foundation of Savage's theory. And, 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 and let me just walk through that because, I, again, I'm sure I'm trampling over ground that most of you have seen, but just in case not. So but very crudely, the sure thing principle says that if you're comparing, uh, if you're looking at two lotteries which have the same outcome in some state of the world or in some event, you can ignore that and just make your decision based on the where, where the two options differ. Okay? So when you're comparing L1 and L2, you can forget about the yellow ball and what you're really comparing is the sort of red-black contrast. All right. Well, So you look at that and you make up your mind, um, and then you do the same for L3 and L4. And here, again, you can ignore the yellow because uh, 100 is the same now. But if you cross out the yellow column, you just see that these L1 just is the same as L3, and L2 just is the same as L4 in the sort of informal sense, right? Uh, so uh, it makes no sense, rationally speaking, to prefer L1 to, but not prefer L3 to L4. So it's clearly in violation of the sure thing principle. It actually um, goes a bit deeper than this, and uh, it's also in violation of Savage's P5, sometimes called the probabilistic sophistication axiom. Uh, and this is the axiom that requires you to reveal probabilities that cohere with standard, qualitative, uh, standard axioms of qualitative probability. It's not too difficult to see why, how that happens here as well, although if you're not familiar with Savage, this may come a bit quickly. So the idea is that when you, uh, prefer, when you express a preference for L1 over L2, you reveal, uh, you reveal your uh, more probable than relation or part of it, and what you reveal is that you regard red as more probable than black. And that's because um, uh, you, 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 in effect, got the same outcomes, but contingent, in the one case, on red, and, and in the other case, contingent on black. So you reveal, reveal red to be more probable than black, in your mind, by, by, pre, uh, by picking L1 over L2. Uh, but if that's the case, then by standard probability laws, you should you should hold red or yellow to be more probable than black or yellow. That's just the quasi-additivity condition. But you violate that in expressing a preference for L4 over L3 because here L your preference for L4 reveals that you regard black or yellow as more probable than, black, than red or yellow. Okay. Now, it's, it, th these two things look very tightly connected in, in this particular case, and so they are. But, uh, in fact, these conditions are quite independent of one another. Um, it's a uh, quite famous paper of uh, Maschina and Schmeidler, I think, uh, who show you can be a non-expected utility maximizer, but still probabilistically sophisticated in this sense. So you can violate separability and still be 
still uh, respect P5. Whether it sort of means anything to still respect P5 in that context is a separate question. But they're formally, they're quite independent. And both of them are violated here. So we've got a sort of double refutation, if you like, of Savage, or so it would seem. Okay. So Ellsberg's explanation of this was, well, uh, what's wrong with, with Savage's theory is it fails to recognize what he called ambiguity aversion. And uh, for, uh, in Ellsberg's mind, it's, ambiguity aversion has become a behavioral concept since, but in, in Ellsberg, I think it's quite clearly a psychological concept. And what ag al ambiguity aversion is, is just a simple disliking of not knowing what's going on in your option, or not knowing what your option is promising you. And so, if you, I think most of you will have had this intuition immediately. If you think about L1 versus L2, well, L1, you know, you know what your chances are. You know you're getting 30 out of a 90 times, you're getting, you're getting the prize. And L2, you just don't, have no idea how, what, what chances you face, right? Uh, so, in, uh, in Ellsberg's terms, you just dislike the fact that in L2, you don't know you can't do any planning, you can't sort of get your mind, expectations sorted out, whatever it is. It's a psychological dislike. Okay, and the reason why you flip is because it's just the other way around in the L4 versus L3, because in this case, now you know it's 100. Uh, for sure, your chances of getting the prize is 60 out of 90, but you don't know what your chances are in L3. So that's Ellsberg's. And that would be this sort of informal theory which I've just sketched out here I call psychological ambiguity aversion and that will be a, my sort of stalking horse in this, in this talk. All right, so that's Ellsberg's explanation and uh, I mean largely something like that has been accepted by the literature in one form or another, cleaned up, and uh, people have tried to uh, have made various responses to this. I mean th those, I really should say they're sort of, uh, there are those who just say, look, this is irrational end of the story, you know. Uh, stick with Savage. Uh, interesting that people are not always rational, but that's just an empirical issue. Uh, as normative theorists, and of course, uh, I'm doing normative theory because I'm a philosopher, this is not of any interest. A lot of philosophers have said that, actually. Um, but those who take it seriously as a normative problem uh, have, have done a variety of things. So one of the things that they've done is said, well, uh, this means we can't think of beliefs as probabilities. We need to think of them in some sort of broader sense, maybe in, in terms of multiple probability functions, maybe in terms of capacities and so on. Very sort of. And along with this uh, revisionary stance to what belief is, there's also a sort of revisionary stance to what decision rules are appropriate in, in these contexts of what one might call severe uncertainty. Uh, maximizing the minimum expected utility relative to your family of probability functions. Maximizing shock A expected utility. I mean, there are lots. Fabio, actually. I should say thank you to Fabio at this point because his talk yesterday kind of was the perfect platform for me today. So you've seen a lot of these things already, although that was in the five minutes, 20 years in five minutes part of the thing. Yeah, but you saw them anyway. We'll see them a bit more slowly as we go through this time. All right, so uh, that's uh, very crudely where the literature is. Of course, it's much more formally sophisticated than I mean. Um, I think there's something missing from this thing because, uh, really, if you accept Ellsberg's description of the problem, then uh, the way in which I set it up here in the table over here, which is the way everybody does it, is not actually a, a correct framing of the problem. It doesn't include everything that Ellsberg says agents regard as relevant to their decision making. And if there's one thing about Savage, that you're, you know, the mantra that one always has to repeat whenever you teach Savage is, it only works if you describe the problem to the level of de detail necessary to capture absolutely everything that the agent takes into account. If you miss anything out, then maximizing subjective expected utility is going to lead you the wrong way. Okay? And Savage's theory doesn't carry with it its own specification about how to frame decision problems. So you always have to take Savage along with some extra theory about what matters, okay? and then you put the two together and then you can use this theory. And that incidentally is why revealed preference theory is just cr a crazy methodology because you can learn absolutely nothing by observing preferences unless you have a background theory of belief attribution which is telling you what possibilities people are recognizing. That's my little ideological stick here that uh, well, the shake, right? <laughs> the shake part. So you, you need to have some view about what people think they're making decisions between. And this is not it, if, if Ellsberg is right. 
If Ellsberg's correct, then uh, we need to take into account the distributions of the balls. The states are the distributions of those balls, right? As well as the draws from the ball. So it's not just that black is drawn or that yellow is drawn or whatever. It's that, you know, there were 25, there were 30 red, 25 yellow, and, and 35 black. You can add to 90 maybe. Um, and so on. I mean, though, that's the complete description of the state of the world. If Ellsberg is right, and I think Ellsberg is right. So you must put that into, uh, into the description of the states of the world. And if you put those into the descriptions of the state of the world, you might as well get your consequences right at the same time. The consequences are not just um, the final amount of money that you land up with. They're also your chances of landing up with that amount of money. Because these distributions of these balls determine what your chances are. Now, of course, I'm not saying yet that chances matter. I will say chances matter in a minute. But when you start framing the decision from at the beginning, you better put everything in. And then later you can sort of explicitly say, this isn't going to count. You will have some axiom which says, sort of, you know, my preferences are independent of this stuff or whatever. Yeah. Well, I don't think you can put in the state space whatever you want. As I said, the general rule is you should put in the state space whatever it is that you think agents are taking into account when they make their decision. I mean, so where you're modeling somebody else's decision problem, to think what is it that they recognize as real features of the world. So if you're savage, you don't think there are any real chances. But if, if the, your agent thinks there are real chances in the world, then you better put that into the state space because they're going to be thinking in those terms. And if you want to model their thinking, you better have objects there that allow them to do, to do their thinking, as it were. So it's not, it's not just I put there whatever I like. I put there whatever I have good reason to think uh, the agent takes into account. Now, I don't know that in advance, so I'm, I just, I, I'd be cautious here. I put as much in as we could possibly require in order to do this exercise properly. Now, to, if it's going to be completely ad hoc, I need to say at some point why those things to a rational agent, and I will try and do that at some point. But that's right. Um, mm. so if I, I mean, if I look at what you write there, yeah. uh, I would say then your state space. Let me just read the read the first line. Mm -hmm. The space, the state space uh, is a product space, yeah. and you have red, black, yellow, mm -hmm. and zero yellow ball, one yellow ball, two yellow ball, 60 exactly. yellow ball. So it's exactly. it's three times 61. Yeah, it might, you know, not everything in the product might be, so it might be that you can't have the answer of red is zero and you draw a red. So there'll be some... No, uh, in yeah, fact, yeah, I yeah, mean, I'm yeah. exactly giving yeah. the number of yellow balls. So I'm just saying three times 61, which is zero to 60 yellow. Yeah. But then at that point, if you do that, yeah. the second line disappears. Because uh, when you when you do this uh, when you write this matrix, yeah. uh, at that point there are no more chances. There are just the payoffs that remain in the cells. Yeah, but but wait a minute. So so the, the, here's the, here's how I think you play the rules if you're doing savage, right? You put into the states everything that matters to belief, and you put into the consequences everything that matters to desire or utility. The states of the subject. The, yeah. The states okay. Of the subject. So, okay. So but that's the separation that we're trying to achieve here. So. Uh, first, we put in the state's distributions of balls, because that matters to their beliefs. Right? Then we put in the consequences, the chances, just in case you care about your chances. So, uh, in a minute, I will try and persuade you that uh, a rational person can care not just about the amount of money they get, but also their chances of getting that money. Maybe when you get the money, you don't care so much. But if you don't get the money and you never had a chance, that's worse than not getting the money. Think about, well, I might as well make the argument now. Think, think you go into, you, you enter a lottery, and uh, uh, it turns out you don't win. Okay, you don't win, right? Then it turns out that the way in which that thing was drawn made it impossible for you to win. You never had a chance. That's a lot worse. <laughs> you need a kidney. I mean, you know, make, we make this more dramatic and so on. So, okay. All right, so uh, why they matter is another question. Maybe in this case because of fairness, maybe in other cases different things. 
But I, I think we went to be at the, at the beginning, we don't want to rule out that chances matter, right? Because they might matter to people. After all, we're not as economists in the business of telling people what they should like. Just they better be consistent. All right, so if you accept the story, then um, we, uh, we really should uh, reframe our decision problem. Now, what I've done is I've got a table up here in which uh, uh, it's also a partial representation of the decision problem, but this time I'm only representing the bits that weren't represented in the other one. So all that I'm putting up here are distributions, and, and I'm going to now make, for presentational purposes, a massive simplification. I'm going to say, let's think about simplified Ellsberg problem in which what you know is that it's either all black or all yellow, but you don't know which in this thing. And I don't think, you know, this is, you interrupt me here if you think I'm wrong, but I don't think this is going to make any difference to anybody's theory about how agents behave under severe uncertainty. Essentially, all these theories look at the sort of the extreme points <laughs> anyway. Um, so the simplified problem will give us a very, very uh, good handle on the original Ellsberg problem. Okay, so from now on we're in the simplified setup. You don't know how many black, you don't know how many yellow, but you know it's either all black or it's all yellow. Okay? Then our problem looks just like this. You've either, you, there's only two possible distributions, and then of course two possible draws. So in the product space there are four states, right? but we only look at two. And these two, state, these two states of the world determine your chances of getting the hundred dollars. These numbers here are just your chances of hundred dollars. So I, th I don't, won't go through all of it, I'll just give you one example. If you choose L1 and there's 30 red, remember this is the one which pays out if, you, if the red is drawn, well, your chances are just one third. Uh, in the case of L2, it pays out if a black ball is drawn, well, if they're all black, then your chances are two thirds. If, you're, if they're all yellow, your chances are zero. Okay? So that's, that's our reframed problem. Um, now we're just gonna suppose that the agent is a subjective expected utility maximizer, and we're going to also just suppose that they apply the principle of indifference. I mean, this is just to exhibit a set of rational attitudes. Um, they regard the two possible states up here as equally likely. Why not? You don't have anything else. Um, and then we just crank the handle. Well, if you prefer L1 to L2, well, then your utility for the chance of one third has got to be greater than your 50 50 averaging over the utility of two-thirds chance and your utility of zero chance, right? Okay. Same, we can do the same for L4 over L3. This time you've got utility of two-thirds has to be greater than the 50-50 over one-third and, and one. That then shows that the clever ones amongst you already seeing the pattern. We're getting a which defines the Ellsberg preferences relative to these preferences over chances, okay? And this is the pattern. Well, uh, that these intervals, this utility in the, uti the intervals between the utilities of the chancels are, in other words, you're risk averse with respect to chances. So, uh, given what I should really say, uh, diminishing marginal utility chances, or given risk aversion with respect to chances, Ellsberg preferences are consistent with Savage's theory. Okay, contrary to the standard view. Okay. Yeah, yeah it <laughs> the trouble with having quick people in the room is that you, you know, you're, my 20 slides down will eventually come to that conclusion. But uh, uh, yeah, it, I think the interpretation is completely different, though. I mean, formally, what we will end up with is uh, something a bit like KMM, but um, uh, with details that are not differences that are not very important. But their interpretation is quite different. Can I wait a little bit and we can, talk, we can uh, discuss whether the, the difference of interpretation really matters or not. But uh, uh, what I would like to argue is that if you're a smooth ambiguity theorist, this is the way you should think about your theory. Okay? Not, the way, not the official story about second order probability densities over first order chance functions. Sorry, no, no, go on. No, no, I, I didn't get the first name. So, uh, there is this Nelson paper that say, so let me, let me see if I'm getting the point, which I, by the way, which I, very, which I like a lot. You say, look, uh, the way I would see what you just said 
is in some situation, the probabilistic information on the states immediately translates into probabilistic information about the outcomes. And so we could quotient the state space and get uh, Ascom Bauman acts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. basically, you, let me see if I'm following. So you're saying, what I'm doing is the, the given probabilities over the states transform the savage, quotes and quotes, act in Ascom Bauman into, in, in Esberg, into Ascom Bauman acts. Over these Ascom Bauman acts, I'm going to behave as a savage expected utility maximizer, yeah. but now consequences are genuine lotteries. That's and right. then it depends on my risk aversion right. and lottery payoff. So I'm, I'm going to be a savage decision theorist with respect to the horse lotteries, but I'm not going to be a von Neumann Morgenstern man on the. I see. Uh, no, no, this is the point. No, okay, so this is yeah. what uh, Nelson, uh, which is a Precursor in the sense of KMM does the formal does a formal theory in that direction, and okay, it's uh, it's very interesting. So okay, we can I'll get the reference it, from but, you afterwards because okay. I don't know that paper. Actually, that's good. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, so uh, a lot of what you said we're just going to do slowly now. Um, get back to the get back to Anskin um, and to exhibit these things. But first, let me just say. Uh, Something about risk aversion. I, I guess everybody's familiar with that. Just, so intuitively, someone is risk averse with respect to any kind of good, a divisible good, G. What, you know, this can be all sorts of different things. Uh, if they view losses and gains of, of quantities of G different, that's the idea of risk aversion as I understand it. Uh, and generally, and so we take risk aversion behaviorally to be revealed in preferences for constant equivalence, equivalence in expectation of risky acts, right? So for instance, this is a standard one, is you have, if you're risk averse with respect to the divisible good money, then you have a preference for a $50 over a 50-50 gamble that pays $0 or $100, depending on the toss of a coin or something like that, right? Uh, in this case, uh, you, your risk aversion with respect to chances is revealed in your preference for L1 here, which gives you a one-third chance whatever the state of the world, and you prefer that to either L2 or L5, both which respectively, I mean, this is still assuming equal probabilities, right, you could. Um, you, your, your risk aversion is revealed in your preference for this constant chance over the, the lotteries which offer, you know, uh, equal gains in chances and equal gains and losses in chances in either direction, okay? And you, so your risk, risk aversion uh, consists in preferring the center, in the chance distribution. Okay, so it's just like monetary risk aversion, but independent of it, right? You can be risk neutral with respect to money, but risk averse with respect to chances of money, and the other way around. I mean, the other way around is the normal situation, but you can be this way around. So, so we, we just, uh, you know, it's a more enriched space in which you can have more attitudes because they're more good. Uh, so, as you see, risk aversion with respect to chances in this situation implies a preference for hedging, which is the sort of characteristic behavioral pattern of the uncertainty of this. Okay. Formally, as uh, we're in, I mean, I, I don't particularly like the Anscombe Almond setup, but let, this is the thing that everybody works with, so let's deal with it. So, we're in an Anscombe Almond setup, and Fabio went through this yesterday, so I'll just go through this very quickly because the notation is slightly different. So the idea of the anscombe Alman setup is that we have uh, some set pi of probabilities distributions which are just lotteries over some set of goods, which I'm going to call gamma. I've only worked with one good, the $100. And it made life very, very simple. And so, I mean, all my examples will be in terms of this one good set. Um, but in principle, you can have as many as you like in there. Uh, we have a set of events, uh, which are just sets of states, right? Uh, your, your savage set of acts which are just all the functions from states of the world to lotteries, or you can do it the way these guys do it, if you like. I don't think it makes any difference here. Um, and then your preference relation is on your set of acts. So that's your basic anscombe Almond setup. And the important thing here is this notion of a linear space. Which again, I'm sure we've seen this one. So we say that a of acts is a linear space if there's a mixture act, which is denoted this way. So if you've got two acts, F and G, then your mixture of F and G, your alpha mixture of F and G is just this, alpha, this, this object here defined in this way. Right? So it's just the act which gives you F's consequence in any state of the world with alpha, probability alpha, 
weight alpha, I should say, and g's consequence with one minus alpha. Okay, so we, uh, we're in a linear space because we've got acts with lottery outcomes, and so we can mix them up in this kind of way. So that's the, the nice, powerful thing about the Anscombe-Allman setup. And uh, what, what I said about risk aversion in the, in the slide before, about implying hedging, just means in this framework that if you're risk-averse with respect to chances, then when uh, uh, you're indifferent between any two acts, F and G, you will at least as prefer the mix of those two acts. Right? So I just go back a page. In there. So that, that's just formally restating what I said up here. Here, L1 here is the mix of L2 and L5. L2 and L5, if you're indifferent between them, then you at least prefer L1. Um, and uh, this here is, uh, is the sort of, I mean, it's, it's the standard, it's the characterizing condition for uncertainty aversion. Um, so, what we, my story did, gives you is uncertainty aversion in the behavioral sense out of the psychological story about risk aversion, chance risk aversion. Okay, so what? Um, it's not the only theory that gives you this, so uh, it's just one more theory that's out there, and now we have to say, we have to say something about which, which theory is better, and to a certain extent this will depend on theoretical preferences, since the data is pretty sparse here. But let me say a little, little bit about how one can separate some of these hypotheses in terms of experiments that have yet to be performed properly. Okay, and, uh, and we sort of hope that if I say that somebody will go out and do the experiment because I can't do them. Um, it's just not, not hard work enough, I think. Uh, so we've, we've seen two hypotheses, the one that I've just presented now, the chance risk aversion hypothesis, and Ellsberg's original one, but we, you can sort of fill in for the Ellsberg one the variants that depend on a similar story, which I'm going to call psychological ambiguity aversion, and both of these hypotheses explain the Ellsberg preferences, but just in terms of, in different, quite different terms, actually. One in terms of a sort of direct preference for certainty, so it's, it's something about uh, um, uh, your attitudes to information, and the other about preferences over, I mean, risk-averse preferences over chances. Right? Uh, why they are different? Oh, because to interpretation. I mean, just just strike the differences because in okay. my head. Well, uh, uh, in the in the the way Ellsberg conceives it, and, and the way I think the psychological ambiguity aversion thing is, is it's your preferences are still fundamentally about the payoffs. What you care about are just the final payoffs. What you dislike about these lotteries is the sort of informational state that you're in. Um, so it's a, some kind of discomfort at the lack of information that you have. Okay. Whereas on most of it's not about a uh, discomfort about the lack of information. It's a, it's a definite risk averse or chances which are taken to be real, are taken to be parts of the payoffs. Okay, now because the way, I mean, just, do we have, I have, do I have two minutes? The way I would see that uh, is that basically we're talking about a statistician who doesn't know a model. Right. So uh, I would say, I mean, the way, let me say, I see the Asberg paradox, and from my reading of Asberg paper, this seems reasonable. This guy dislike his ignorance about the data generating process. And in a sense, Asberg writes that because he, he may, I mean, he ends up with a family of uh, stock, let, I mean, let me rephrase it in, in uh, the math speak that I can use. Yeah which is, uh, in a sense, you say, look, uh, he ends up with the, fa the decision maker will end up with a family of probabilities that are the statistical models, and then he cannot aggregate them. Ba basically, he cannot get what, he doesn't know what is the prior over these models. So, in a sense, uh, this is exactly risk aversion uh, over ignorance over statistical models that generates an inability, if you want, and this, and this is where the multi -prior, multiple prior literature heads to. Is gener but if you want, this is exactly a chance risk aversion. Yeah. He's averse to the fact that he doesn't know the true quotes and quotes and quotes 
statistical model. I think these two, I agree with you, they're quite difficult to disentangle. But, but, so that's why I, I, I want to try and give you an example in which I think they will make opposite predictions. And then, let, and then let's see whether you really agree with me. But Pier Paolo, one. Thanks, Rick. No, this is uh, not uh, you know, to you, but I think in the interest of the audience, I think that uh, using expressions like the two of you have used may be misleading. Uh -huh. This you know, disliking the ignorance about the true data generating process, because this suggests that uh, uh, if you could experiment, uh, you would, uh, in order to reduce that ignorance. Uh, but under standard conditions, ambiguity aversion is kind of equivalent to aversion to experimenting. So it is not a dislike, uh, it, it is not that you don't like uh, being ignorant about the true data generation process. You dislike being ignorant about the distribution of consequences uh, okay. for the action you pick. I mean, I know you know this, but uh, oh, for no, someone who is helpful. not conversant with the theory. That is very helpful and it helps me uh, answer uh, Fabio's question because in a sense I think that is part of the difference between the psychological risk, what I'm calling the psychological risk aversion hypothesis and mine. My, the risk aversion with respect to chances wouldn't predict uh, uh, more experimentation whenever it's possible. Ah, okay, okay, so, so, all right. I actually think people have a, a, quite a, a family of different views about what <laughs> ambiguity aversion is. So one of the problems here is, is teasing this out, because behaviorally, the, it all rests on a, what's behaviorally quite a thin set of differences, and sort of there's this big psychology that's built on it. So let's see if this helps, and, and or not, okay. So uh, here's the, what I call the negative Ellsberg problem, and you, for the obvious reason, it's the Ellsberg problem, except that now you face losses rather than gains. Okay. But otherwise, it's, it's just the same. Now, I think um, if you are a, a psychological and, uh, ambiguity aversion person, what you will say is, well, you will still see ambiguity aversion in the losses case, because what people dislike is the uncertainty. There's no less uncertainty here than there was. I mean, the contrasts are just the same in the negative problem as they were in the positive. You've got the, the, the one where you know the risks and the one where you don't know the risks. You don't like it when you don't know, so just the same. My, uh, the chance risk aversion hypothesis with a small auxiliary hypothesis will pr predict exactly the opposite. Right? Um, my theory will predict uncertainty loving behavior if we take chances of losses to be just negative chances. Then the concave transformation uh, it's characteristic of this risk aversion will give you ambiguity or uncertainty loving behavior in the negative Ellsberg case. Okay, so it just makes opposite predictions. I mean, now the question is, you know, how do we test a normative theory and so on? So it's going to be a little bit... And there is some data about these things. Um, so as I say, so I, I mean, first, I, I mean, just make sure everybody agrees with me that we, we've got a contrast here now, at least. Um, yeah. And you don't see, you don't see. No, I don't see. Uh, explain you why. Uh -huh. You like uh, this. Uh... So you like this setting where there is uh, one indivisible price, and in this setting, basically, when you have just one indivisible price, you are killing uh, standard risk attitudes as irrelevant. Okay, and you are making one probability just uh, you know the, um, the 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 scalar with respect to which you can define what. Uh, risk aversion is on the concavity of the function, right? And this is again, uh, you know, in this setting, uh, what you are doing is, uh, in my opinion, just the smooth ambiguity mode. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. No, no, I, I, okay, but I mean, so this is all, I mean, I, I said the lesson from that is that smooth ambiguity, the smooth ambiguity model shouldn't be put together with the family of psychological risk aversion family, um, psychological ambiguity aversion families. Actually, KMM is a chance risk aversion theory. It just doesn't know it, that's what it is yet. All right, and that's, <laughs> that's what philosophers are here, for tell people what they really think they think. <laughs> uh, so, no, I, okay. I, 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 here's a contrast. I'm not sure who believes which theory here, if anybody, but at least there's, there's two theories and we can see which way people go. There, there is some evidence. The evidence is not itself not an ambiguous in the, in the normal sense, right? It seems to favor the risk-loving hypothesis. 
There is some evidence that people are risk-loving with respect to losses. And this kind of, the rough intuition seems, I mean, sort of, you think of the gambling situation. You're playing cards with somebody, you start off with a certain amount of money, you start, you're losing your money, right? Now you're in the negatives, and you think, oh, Jesus, you know, what the hell? I'm already down. Double or quits. You know, there's this sort of double or quits cry. It's very characteristic of the person who's losing. And the person who's up is a bit resistant to that. And I think, why not? Well, here's a you know, possible explanation of that is that when you're down, you know, you might as well risk going down twice as much if you can get yourself back to, you know, a respectable state so you can go home and your partner doesn't hit you over the head with a bottle for losing the mortgage for that month or something like that. It's just a little story that maybe rationalizes these things sometimes. Anyway, that's the evidence, but I think the evidence is really not clean. So there's a lot of need for... There are no experimentalists here, unfortunately. But anyway, let's see. Um, okay. So, uh, just to now sort of wrap up the story uh, and, uh, uh, before I talk about KMM. So, the claim here has been that when, when the problem is correctly framed, risk aversion explains ambiguity or uncertainty aversion in a way that's completely consistent with Savage. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, sometimes at this point people are starting to scream. I mean, they say, well, but wait a minute. I mean, we've got a problem here. I saw your first slide, and in your slide you showed me very, very clearly that this it violates Savage's theory. I mean, we saw independence being violated. In yellow, we saw it, right? I mean, how much clearer can it get than that? So there are, you know, there are only two possibilities here. Either the theory is not partition dependent, I mean, which, so, you know, it works for Savage if you, if you frame it one way, and it doesn't work for Savage if you frame it another way. That's terrible, too, because it means that your what's rational is subject to these kind of vagaries that are not controllable by rationality, and that's not a very good answer, what doesn't seem like a very promising route, or you better say something about why that first framing was not the correct framing of the problem. Right? And, I, and so, of course, my answer is the first. Uh, is the second, not the first. <laughs> of course my answer is the second. Uh, the point about that initial framing, which is the one that we have, have up here, is that uh, it's not a framing in which everything that matters in the payoffs are, are written down, because now we treat the chances as payoffs. Right? That's, that's really what's going on. So it's not that the theory is partition dependent. It's that if you correctly frame the problem, then you get the correct answer. According to this thing. So there's no, no deep problem here, I'd say. All right. So uh, I think one way of looking at this whole Ellsberg story, this is sort of stepping back from my theory, is that you face a kind of trilemma when the, the Ellsberg thing presents you with a trilemma. You can't have savage and find Norman Morgenstern and the Ellsberg preferences. You can't combine all three of those. You must give up one of them. Um, you can't, so yeah, you can't, formally you can't, the, the preference relation can't satisfy the savage axioms on the set of acts, the von Neumann Morgenstern axioms on the set of lotteries, and the Ellsberg pattern. That's the impossibility that we're presented with. And then you just pick which one you throw away, right? And so if you're a Bayesian conservative, if you like, you just reject three and say this is irrational behavior. If you're um, part of the sort of radical school that we've seen emerging in the last 20 years, what you do is you reject savage, and you say people don't have precise probabilities, and blah, blah, blah. You maximum expected utility. You do all this kind of stuff. Um, and if you're me, you reject number three. You say actually for Norman Morgenstern is wrong when Norman Morgenstern is, uh, doesn't, is, is a false theory because it doesn't capture people's attitudes to chances correctly. And in particular, it, you know, I, I would reject the sort of this very simple version of linearity that's built into the von Norman Morgenstern thing, which takes it that it, the utility of a chance, x of some good g, is just x times the utility of g. That's the kind of keystone of the von Norman Morgenstern theory. And that's what we reject here. If you're, what we say is your, your chances are a more complex function of your, your, your utilities for the chances uh, are uh, 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 what do we want. It's, it's, a, it's a, is a concave function of this, of this thing on the other side. Right. So, so, so that's, what, that's, the, that's the thing of uh, for Noen Morgenstern that's getting rejected. Can position yourself in that. What do you think is plausible? 
All right, just quickly with the literature in the last 10 minutes, we can, this will take us to, there's some stuff that's, and probably this is, I, I, I mean, I don't know the literature well enough to really have put, I suppose, all, this, all the important ones here. This, uh, this paper by Halevi in Econometrica 2007, which uh, draws the, a tight connection between ambiguity aversion or uncertainty aversion and compound, uh, in a, and failure to reduce compound lotteries. And actually, I think Kalevi's paper is based on a kind of misunderstanding in the sense that he takes these lot the, the two probability distributions both objective in some kind of way, and so compounding applies. I think the right way to understand it is in terms of subjective distributions over objective ones. Um, so then compounding can't apply in a sort of straightforward sense. You can define a version of compounding if you've got some axiom which takes you from objective chances to subjective probabilities. But that link um, breaks down in the Ellsberg case, and it breaks down precisely for the reasons that we've described here. So in the behavior that Halevi is observing is just chance risk aversion, and so his theory is, in a sense, a confirmation of what I'm saying here. Um, there's a more interesting paper by Kramer and Stone, uh, which I won't say very much about it, which uh, in, in some sense gives you a story about why people are chance risk averse, and they do it in terms of anticipated regret and joy. So they, I mean, they do the same thing for the Ellsberg as the Sugden and Looms people did for the, the Alley. Um, and the trick here is that they, they use these chances as reference points for calculating how much regret you'll experience when you learn the outcome of the draw. And the kind of idea is that when you make a draw, when, when you're told what ball is drawn, it gives you some information about what the distribution of balls was, ex ante. When you lose, because uh, you're pessimistic, you take your as your reference point the expected value of the choice that you didn't make. When you win, you take as your reference point the expected value of the lottery that you did choose. Right? And th the first is always going to be bigger. It's going to be a bigger regret than a joy. And so you're going to... That will explain... Explain... Uh, chance risk aversion in a sense. I, don't, I, I think this kind of, I don't like this kind of explanation because I think it's questioning. I mean, uh, why take those reference points? I mean, it seems to me that it's the aversion that's primitive and then the reference point choice is being driven by that, but psychological people might like it this way around. Okay, KMM. Um, so this is the thing that we was already raised before. So, uh, formally the KMM model is pretty much the same. I mean, all I've presented here is, what is, is a special case of KMM where you have just this one good. So the expected value of the risk of the lottery is always just the chance of the, of the one good that we've got here. Um, but as I said, I think the interpretation is quite different. So let's just have a look very quickly at, at what these theories, when, when we cash it out formally. I haven't done anything very formally, but so let me do it a little bit more formally and then we can look at it interpretation. So we need a little bit more uh, vocabulary here, so we, we've got our lotteries here, um, denoted by these P's, uh, and uh, the P sub R, so P sub I is the lottery on the set of goods, uh, a gamma, uh, is, is your lottery determined by your option at state SI, okay, and the J here is indexing your goods, okay, so you've got these P sub I superscript J's, hideous combination of subscripts and superscripts, but there you go. And then we have PR is your subjective probabilities over the states, okay? And then I, I just, so no, this is just your expected utility for the lottery, and that's your phenomenon, ex Morganstone expected utility. All right, so von Ansken Aumann just says, what do we do? Well, we work out the phenomenon, Morganstone expected utility of the lotteries, and then we average over the states of the world using subjective probabilities. So it's you, your phenomenon savage combination, that's the benchmark here. What do KMM say? They say, well, take the phenomenon Morgenstern expected utilities, transform them using this concave function phi, right? This is what gives you your risk aversion here, and then you average using your subjective probabilities. Okay. What do I say? Well, I haven't really said anything definite, but this is sort of what I want to say. Um, I, I think this is, this is a, a reasonable hypothesis, but more cautiously, um, these transformations may differ per good. I don't see any reason to suppose that your 
risk aversion can be coalesced. Well, I, you know, somebody may persuade me that there's a sort of natural way of doing so. But the starting point is that if you've got a set of different goods, suppose you've got money, friendship, you know, travel to Italy, these are all things that you've got lotteries over and might be very risk-averse with respect to the chances of some, not very risk-averse with respect to chances. In principle, that seems possible to me. And so we'll have different transformations indexed by the good that you're thinking of. Uh, and so you've got this family of concave functions. I've lost, what am I doing here? Okay, this family of concave functions, one for each good. Um, you transform the, 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 the chance-weighted utility of the good. Right, this is not done formally very well. And then you just add up and uh, average with your... Go ahead. Just a clarification about uh, the last row. Yeah. I don't see why I should treat differently the different lotteries, I mean, the interpretation. Uh, um, well, I, it's, it, I'm just being cautious here. It, it, I, so suppose you've got a lottery uh, or a set of uh, goods which consists of money and friendship. Okay. Um, uh, I see no reason to think that your risk, your risk attitudes to chances of obtaining money should be the same as your risk attitudes to your chances of obtaining friendship. Um, that's uh, maybe. I, it's, uh, I just don't see any, it doesn't seem immediately plausible to me. So I think we should, at the beginning, separate these things out, then arrive at an overall utility for these combinations of things that's based on your transformations of each good separately. That's the thought. Now, I, I just, it's an, obviously the KMM hypothesis is simpler. It's going to be easier to use. It might be well motivated in many practical concepts. I'm, I'm happy to sort of say, okay, okay I mean, mine's just, I'm, I'm with KMA, we're in the same camp. It's just how, what simplification to introduce. But uh, I think strictly we should keep them separate. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually done, yeah, so we might as well. I, I won't, we'll talk about the interpretation now, sort of in the questions, I guess, because that's the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to just. Okay, know, we've got strict separation. First, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, in case you forget question, at the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not sure that uh, Bradley is not a special case of KMM. Okay. And the reason is that uh, KMM uh, doesn't say that uh, big phi is a concave function. It says that it is a strictly increasing function. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And of course, it, excuses, it uses concavity to explain uh, you know, the pattern uh, that El Ellsberg uh, you know, pointed yeah, out. Right, yeah. So Fair I enough. think uh, you know, that you can uh, combine your stuff uh, into something that is, you know, an increasing function of objective expected utility, although it is not necessarily a concave function, but then uh, when you specialize, you know, by just looking at one good uh, that you can get or not, uh, yeah. gives you the same as... Yeah, right, okay, so there's sort of various dimensions we can generalize on. We can, it doesn't have to be ambiguity averse, it can be loving in some dimensions, it could also be per good, there could be ways in which... So, but, okay, I mean, broadly, we're all in the same... Camp, I think, formally speaking, it's broadly, yeah. right. <laughs> broadly right. within you know the sort of distance that philosophers can recognise. We're actually all saying the same thing. You know, mathematicians will notice the important difference. Uh, just for curiosity, uh, maybe stupid. I'm really not expert of the field. What if? Uh, Instead, basically, in your presentation, at some time you assume that the states of the world about which we have no information are equally probable. Yeah. And then you have the utility. Now, it makes sense to me. But, but you're basically doing two arbitrary choices. Yeah. Uh, assume that uh, I define probability of the states as a paranoic probability. So states which are bad for me have a higher probability. Yeah. You can get, I guess, I guess, so one question is, it's perfectly equivalent as a theory uh, to respect to yours. Yeah, so, so in, 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 the pro, in the sort of proper general version of the theory, this, 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 is, not, this is your subjective probabilities and they can, can, be, they can be paranoid in your sense or anything you like. I, I was only using these equal probability distributions as a kind of salient. It was to give an example which shows the consistency of Savage's theory with the Ellsberg preferences, but there's no, I, I don't, not claiming it's the rational set of beliefs to have in these situations. 
Okay, yeah. No, it, it just, it, I mean, the, the consequence is the same, which is a bit philosophically, I mean, it's easier to talk about yeah. uncertainty. So if you, were, if you had paranoid, well, so there, there are clearly some belief distributions over the chances which would give rise to non Ellsberg preferences and which would also be savage rationalizable. Ah, okay. So within the savage yeah, family, exactly. all, mm -hmm. so we're really just adding sort of the broad savage framework with some very specific auxiliary hypotheses about what people are actually doing when they confront Ellsberg type problems. And remember, Ellsberg problems, I mean, they don't exist in the wild, you know, nice and cleanly in that way. So it may not be a very, you know, the principle of indifference is lovely theoretically in these very clean theoretical environments. I mean, whether they ever have application in, in the street is another question. I, I think not, but it wasn't. It's a different problem. Yeah. Are there more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Richard again.